Okay, we're recording. So today uh, we're going to do just like we did last week for our for our weekly webinar and just do sort of like open mic and, you know, chit chat and solve problems and things like that. So uh, I'm going to say a few words about a, about a new study that just came out um, to, to, to sort of kick us off. And I'm going to have a little show and tell, uh, and then we'll get into the questions. So like always put your questions in the chat, uh, or, or electronically raise your hand and then I can call on you so that we, you know, we, we, we do it <laughs> in an orderly fashion, if you will. Um, and then, uh, and we'll get going. So the study that I, I, I think I mentioned this last week, this study came out the very end of last month, very end of November, uh, right after Thanksgiving. Um, so it's, you know, came out two, two weeks ago or so. And the title of it, or or the title of uh, title of the press release, which I think was really cool. And what I'll do is I'm going to blog about this later on this week, either this afternoon or sometime tomorrow. I'm going to sort of dissect the study and give you the highlights. I'll put a link to the actual, um, to the actual publication. It was published in a journal called brain behavior and immunity and and you'll see why that's a that, that's a that's important for for um for for what they found but the press release said this which i thought was really cool this is what caught my eye it says scientists uncover how fermented food bacteria can guard against depression and anxiety um and it's and it's funny i was just actually this morning answering questions about um uh, about uh, a fermented food product. Um, somebody was asking me questions about like, how come it has sugar in it? And it actually doesn't have sugar. So I thought this would be a perfect time for me to for me to talk to you guys about it. But um, before I write the blog and kind of go through all the little details, the the end result of this trial, like the sort of moral of the story is, when you eat fermented foods, it changes the level of of lactobacillus in your in your gut, right? It doesn't when you're eating a fermented food like a probiotic soda, I'm going to talk about this product. This is this is GBX Pep from Amare. I'm going to talk about this product. This is Desert Tea. This is also another product I formulated. This is a this is a kombucha. This is a probiotic soda. I'll talk about the differences in a in a second. When you when you drink one of these, even though it has bacteria in it, those bacteria aren't going to become resident in your gut, right? They are what we call transient probiotics. They'll go into your gut. They'll do something, right? There's benefits that they will confer, but it, it, it's not because that they're starting to live there. It's so so that would be what we call a structural change, right? Some some probiotics we take them and they do grow there, right? And that 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 changes the structure of the of the microbiome, and as a result of that, it functions differently, uh, or hopefully functions differently. Um, sometimes we use functional probiotics, whereas you take it. And it changes the function of the microbiome. It changes its production of something. Like maybe it makes the it, it encourages the microbiome to make more serotonin or dopamine, or maybe it changes the environment of the gut so that now other good guys can grow and bad guys can't grow. Right. So, but but maybe it doesn't live there. It just goes out. And so that's one of the reasons that we want to be taking fermented foods on a daily basis. So we're always getting a dose of that functionality, even though it's not really changing what's growing in the microbiome. It's changing how the microbiome is functioning. Does that make sense to everybody? Or is that is there anybody that's confused by that or wants me to explain that anymore? Because that's a really, really important nuance of harnessing the microbiome to improve overall mental wellness. So if there's anyone who doesn't understand that, I'm happy to try to explain it in a different way. Everybody's cool? Okay. All right. Somebody somebody wants me to explain it in a, in a, in a different way here. Where, where'd my cursor go? All right, Colleen, what am I, what, what's, what's missing? Just, just a repeat so I can absorb it again. Okay. Okay. So, so I think what we're going to see like right now, in the world, probiotics are really popular. Prebiotics, fibers, are starting to get more popular. I think what we're going to see over, over time is that these two ways of influencing microbiome metabolism and gut health are going to be put into different boxes where we're going to see that probiotics are really good at changing the function of the microbiome, right? Changing how the microbiome works. Whereas prebiotics are really good at changing the structure of the microbiome, really encouraging growth of good guys and and um, uh, and ungrowth um, or prevention of growth of bad guys. I think we're going to see as the science gets better that we realize, hey, they're both good, but they're both good for different reasons. We actually just finished a clinical trial where we looked at a um, 
I'm trying to think of which of which one of these it was. We just finished two trials, so I might I might mix them up a little bit. We looked at one that was a specific probiotic strain that was supposed to help with weight loss, and it did. It helped with weight loss. People who took the probiotic versus the placebo group lost a lot more weight, significantly more weight in the probiotic group versus the versus the um versus the placebo group. And in that one, in that one, I don't think we saw a change in the microbiome. Um, we also did another study looking at a glucan. So this is a, this is something that's a, it's a, it's a sugar molecule that's extracted from the cell wall of a yeast and it helps your immune system. But we also found that it did change the microbiome. So the aspects of the microbiome that changed in that one were, let me, let me think for a second. Um, the microbiome, oh, I know what it was, uh, butyrate levels went up and uh, acromantia levels went up. So here we're seeing both a functional change, butyrate, this is a short chain fatty acid that the microbiome produces that's good for your immune system. So the you eat this glucan, it gets your microbiome to make more butyrate, that supports your immune system. And then people in this study, because their immune system was stronger, had fewer upper respiratory tract infections, fewer allergies, their immune system was more robust. We also saw when you eat this glucan, your level of, of acromancia goes up. This is a, a specific type of bacteria, a specific species of bacteria in the gut that is associated with your gut lining. And so that's showing us a couple of things that, that now we're changing the bacteria, but we're also improving the integrity of the gut or the flip side of that is that we're there, we're, um, we're reducing leaky gut. So that's something where you're taking this glucan, you're getting a functional change and a structural change in the microbiome. In the probiotic study, we use this specific strain to help with weight loss. People did lose weight more or did lose more weight on the supplement versus the placebo, but we didn't see a significant change in the microbiome. There was actually a trend towards um, a change in the ratio between one class of bacteria called firmicutes and another class called, called bacteroides, that ratio between firmicutes and bacteroides, or what's sometimes called the F to B ratio, F for firmicutes, B for bacteroides, that is related to your metabolism. That changed in a positive direction, suggesting that people were less likely to gain weight and more likely to release their weight. Um, it didn't quite reach statistical significance. So we're still talking to the to the company that makes that probiotic strain to say like, hey, do you still want us to write it up and say like, look, you know, there was a trend for this to change. You know, this might be the underlying reason why these people lost more weight. Um, so we'll see. It's it's probably because we didn't have enough people in the study, but that's that's. So those are two examples of you can take something and it can change the structure what grows there, uh, or you can change something that changed the function, how the microbiome performs. And sometimes you get one or the other, or sometimes you get both. Okay. So in this trial that I, that I just started talking about, um, what they found was that fermented foods will change the environment of the gut, right? Fermented foods are a little bit, how many people like fermented foods of just the people that I can see in the little thumbnails? Do you, do you, do you some, some people love, <laughs> I can, I can, I can see some people shaking their heads and making faces and Dana doesn't like them. Um, most other people did. They're sour, right? They taste a little bit like whether it's yogurt, like un, unsweetened, unflavored yogurt is an acquired taste. These guys actually taste pretty good because they have, they have sweeteners and flavors and things like that in them. But the, but the, but the, 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 by, the byproducts of, of fermentation are, are sour, right? They're, they're acids. And sometimes people just don't like that. Um, that's why there's sometimes an advantage of, if you really don't like the taste of kombucha, you can use kombucha as a base to make something like this, which is a probiotic soda. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But that that taste, that sort of sour, acidic taste that you get, that's important because when that gets all the way down into the lower part of your of your intestines, into your large intestine where your where ninety nine percent of your bacteria live, it changes the environment. And that environmental change is that it slightly acidifies your gut. And so we don't want it too acidic, but we also don't want it too basic. We want it in that Goldilocks zone of being just acidic enough. And that that low acid environment is what really um, promotes the growth of the good bacteria, right? So lact having fermented foods grows more lactobacillus. 
lactobacillus will actually make even more acid to keep that acidic, that slightly acidic environment, slightly acidic. And as a result of that, you see a functional change. So we've, we, we in, in my laboratory, we have shown that if you can improve the environment of the gut, your lactobacillus goes up. When your lactobacillus goes up, your bifidobacterium also goes up. And that's good because the bifidos are the ones that are the sort of the workhorses of making all the beneficial signaling molecules that we want. They make a lot of the neurotransmitters, like serotonin, dopamine, GABA, that kind of stuff. They make a lot of butyrate, you know, so like you can't get the butyrate, uh, um, you can't get the bifidos and all those wonderful feel-good signaling molecules unless you get the lactose and you can't get the lactose unless you have the right environment and you can't get the right environment unless you're eating the right foods. Does that make sense to everybody? So it's really cool that we're we're able to sort of start dissecting all of this. And I think the really cool thing about this new study from the University of Virginia is that they were able to discern that all that, what I just said, is true. But they were also the first ones to show that a lot of these signals of the lactobacillus go through your immune system. You know, so this is yet another, you know, uh, another stick on the pile to show your microbiome controls your immune system. If you can eat these foods to support your microbiome, you're supporting your immune system as a nice side benefit. So they found, um, I want to get the, I want to get the, I want to get the cytokine exactly right. Um, so this one was um, interferon gamma. So your immune system makes a lot of different cytokines. Um, in this glucan study that we just did, we measured four different cytokines, inflammatory compounds, and all four of them went down. So inflammation went significantly down when you took this glucan and it supported your immune system. Your immune system didn't overproduce these inflammatory markers anymore. So this UVA study found the exact same thing. You increase your lactobacilli with fermented foods and they're producing more of this really important immune system modulator. Um, so yeah, they're all interlinked with each other, which I think is super, super exciting. So. Let me, let me go, let me, so let me see if there's any questions about that before I start my show and tell. Susan has her hand up. So let me see if that's a question related to this. Go ahead, Susan. Later. <laughs> Later. Okay. All right. You're just, you're just getting in line for after I finish talking about this. All right. Got it. Um, Colleen, do you have a question about, about this? Yes. Yeah, so are we using that glucan in our products yet, Dr. Sean, or is this a new one? So it's a, it's a different, it's a slightly different structure of glucan. So um, right now we use one called Wellmune, um, it's a it's a one six one three beta glucan, right? That one six one three refers to the to the branching structure of it. Um, we use that in Mentis Sync uh, in the Amari products, right? So that one has really good data on it to show it primes your immune system, right? If if you have allergies and autoimmune system problems and your immune system is high, it brings it down to normal. And if you have a suppressed immune system from stress or sleep deprivation or poor diet or something like that, it brings it up to normal, right? So we have that in there. This new study on this new sort of like, like next generation glucan gives us additional information that, you know, who knows, maybe we'll make a whole nother product around it. Maybe we'll put it into Mentasync. So now we have two different kinds of glucans. I don't, I actually don't know what we'll do with it, but you know, this is, this is where we get ideas for new, for new stuff, you know? Um, yeah. So that new one, I, what perked me up was when you said it increased, um, acromancia, which yeah. is associated with leaky gut. Yeah. Um, so yeah. does our wellmune also do that or is that? I don't know. It's never been, it's never really been studied at, at wellmunes. Most of the data around wellmune has really been shown that it primes your immune system. And then some of the data, and this is, this is data that our lab actually collected for the wellmune company more than a decade ago shows that if your immune system is properly primed, you also have better mental wellness. You, like you like you feel better. Your overall well-being is improved because your immune system is sending signals sort of, sort of to and fro from the from the gut to the brain. Um, but it's never been it's never been shown that it has this acromancy of you know anti-leaky gut effect. So you know I could envision that maybe this new glucan could be like the superstar ingredient in a, in a leaky gut kind of kind of a product or a regimen. So yeah, so we'll see. We'll see what that looks like going going in the future. Um, are there any other questions before I get into the little show and tell? Which the show and tell part of it won't be won't be very long. Um, okay, good. So somebody asked me a question this morning about 
about this product, GBX PEP. So this is an Amari product. Um, this is a what's what's called a probiotic soda. So the 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 whole idea behind these kinds of products is that they have kombucha as a base, but it doesn't taste like kombucha. It's sort of like kombucha light, you know, for people who don't really like that taste of kombucha. So you start off with kombucha and then you you basically water it down, right? You water it down with other stuff so that it, you get some of the benefits of fermented foods, but you don't get maybe all the benefits of a fermented food like this. Like this is a really strong kombucha. If you're a fan of kombucha, you'll love this. If you don't like kombucha, you'll take one sip and you'll politely put it down and walk away, right? Because it's very like, it's very kombucha. It's made for for aficionados of kombucha. Um, so in, in this one, the question was, um, how can it be sugar-free where it lists cane sugar? Um, does anyone know? So it, it does say cane sugar right on the side of the label. If you read down, it actually says two forms of sugar. There's cane sugar, and then later on down, it will say allulose syrup, which is a form of sugar. But on the on the nutrition facts panel up here, it says zero grams of sugar. Does anyone anyone know why why that can be? Or want to want to posit something? Dana? Yeah, those chats blowing up, it feeds the probiotic that makes the kombucha. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the so the probiotic that makes those fermentation products that have all these benefits that I just talked about when you consume it and it goes into your gut, it has to live on something. So the bacteria, the probiotic bacteria that are that are used to make the kombucha, they have to live on that sugar, right? That's their that's the food that they're eating up. But they eat it up. So the sugar starts there and the bacteria eat it up. And sometimes you can tune that fermentation process so that they eat up the sugar and they produce alcohol, right? So, you know, there, there are kombuchas that are, that, are, that are hard kombuchas, right? And they'll get you drunk if you, if you drink enough of them. Um, so that fermentation process, you can really dial in by the types of sugar you use, the amount of sugar you use, the temperatures that you put the bacteria at and how long you hold them at those temperatures, the kind of bacteria you're using. So there's all sorts of variables that you can use to really regulate this, this fermentation process. So the way that these are done, they're done so that we, we use the sugar for the bacteria to make the fermentation products, the polysaccharides and the fatty acids and the, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but then it's it's shut off so they don't continue ferment, fermenting to make alcohol, right? So these are also, also alcohol free, but because it's consumed all the sugar, it's sugar free. Okay. So, so that's why that is. Um, what does this one have? This one might have allulose also. Um, does this have allulose or this one just have monk fruit and yeah, this one also has allulose. So allulose in both of these, um, is a sugar that gives us a sweetness in the in the mouth, right? So it tastes very, very much like sugar. It gives you a really sort of rounded sweetness profile, different than stevia. Stevia can give gives you what we call a sharp sweetness profile, and sometimes you want that depending on the the other actives that you have in the product. Um, this one also has a little bit of monk fruit in it, which is kind of a mild sweetener. It 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 the benefit of monk fruit is that it's sweet but it's not like overpoweringly sweet, but that's also its downside, that sometimes it's not strong enough to sweeten over some of the organic ingredients that we end up using. So um, the, the other advantage of allulose is that our bodies don't metabolize it. So we can put in five grams, seven grams, 10 grams of allulose and get a really nice sugar sensation in terms of taste. But then when it goes into the gut, your body doesn't metabolize it the same way. So if you keep it under about 10 grams, let's say, you actually have no caloric um, uh, contribution. So you don't get any calories out of that because your body will still metabolize it. Your gut bacteria will still metabolize it, but not at such a degree where you're generating calories. Um, so that's a really good thing. It ends up being calorie-free, sugar-free, carb-free, but you get that really nice sugar sensation. So um 
yeah, so that's the that's the that's the that's the end of the show and tell. Are there any are there any questions about that at all? That's no. Let me say one more thing. That's not to say that there aren't plenty of high sugar kombuchas out there on the market, right? If you go to the grocery store and you go to the like now, there's a kombucha section at most grocery stores. You go there and you look across all of those, and they've taken a page out of the yogurt handbook, right? Where you go to the yogurt section and you see all these little cups of sweetened yogurt that have 30, 35, 40 grams of sugar, that's as much as in a Coca-Cola or a Mountain Dew. That's not what we want. Same thing happens on the on the in the kombucha aisle where they've done the same thing. They've made their they've made their their uh, kombucha starting with sugar, but they've either not let the bacteria metabolize all the way through it. So they leave residual sugar or they have a sugar-free kombucha and they add sugar later on. To make to make it taste yummy, okay. So you really have to look at your labels to see is it sugar free, is it a little bit of sugar, or it is a sugar bomb. You know that you. I mean, you might as well be drinking a soda at that point. Um, and you know, instead of a instead of a healthy kombucha, it's not really a healthy kombucha because it's basically a soda. Okay, so that's that. Um, I, like I said, I'll write up this this new study that just came out um, showing the you know fermentation. Uh, uh, lactobacillus, immune system, and then reduction in anxiety and depression, which is like, that's so cool that we're able to kind of unpack, you know, all these mechanisms in a, in a, in a, in a much more nuanced way, you know, like week by week by week. It's really, really super cool. Okay. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to run up here and look in the chat and see, um, does kefir count? Yeah. So, so kefir is is ferment is fermented milk. It's it's kind of like liquid yogurt. The difference is the the cultures that are used in kombucha versus kefir versus yogurt versus kimchi versus etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera, all these different fermented foods they're all just a little bit different in terms of what species of lactobacillus or bifido or or you know any anything else right they're all but they're all fermented foods and because they're slightly different, what I love to recommend to people is to play around and like have some kombucha one day and have some kimchi one day and have some yogurt one day or, you know, have a little bit of all of that every day, you know, so I'm, I'm actually going to drink, you know, one of these later. Um, I probably won't drink both of them, but uh, most mornings I start off with yogurt, you know, unsweetened, unflavored yogurt. Uh, and then I add my own stuff to it to, you know, make it, make it taste better. Um, but yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's what we do is, you know, have, have a little bit of fermented foods sort of sprinkled throughout our day. And because they're all a little bit different, it's, it, it's good to mix it up. Um, and, oh, da oh, Dana. So yeah. So university of Virginia is where this study was, was done. Yeah. I bet it's, I bet it's 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 the it's the local university, so to speak. So I mean, it's the local university. And what's crazy, if you don't mind, like me unmuting yeah, myself, yeah, go ahead. is that we've been talking about this for five years, right? The gut brain connection and all of the things, and everyone that lives near me is acting like it's shocking new information, right? <laughs> and I'm like really trying to reframe my verbiage to be like, yes, isn't it amazing? let me help you with a solution. Like take step one, like start with happy juice rather than waiting for everyone to come up with a product that uses this. Like what would be your, if you were me and people came up to you and were like, Dana, oh my gosh, did you see the study that UVA did with lactobilito? Like however you say that word, yep, like yep. it's amazing. Like what would be your response to turn it around to say, take a step right now? Yeah. And yeah. So I actually answer this question almost on a daily basis. Right. So I'll say I'll, I'll hold, oh, hold on, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me get okay. let me get this out. <laughs> OK, so so, yeah, fermented foods are always going to be great. Right. Pep is great. Desert tea is great. Unflavored, unsweetened yogurt is great. You know, all those fermented foods are lovely and you absolutely should be taking them. But what they're going to do is give you a general improvement in your overall gut health, a general improvement in the environment of your gut and the benefits that come from that. And, th and that's and that's lovely. That, that might be the first step for a lot of people. But then what I like to say is, did you know that the science is even more advanced where we can say, let's not just take general fermented foods and general un 
specified probiotic bacteria, we can actually get specific strains that are targeted to help you with your depression or help you with your anxiety or help you with your stress or help you with your appetite or help you with your fat release or help you with collagen production or help you with, with gut integrity. So, you know, the leaky gut effect, right? And we use, we use about a dozen different strains across the Amari product line all for different reasons, right? Some help with appetite, some help with fat release, some help with these different mood states, some help with help with your immune system, some help with gut regularity, you know? So, but that's something that is specific to the strain. What's happening with fermented foods is just a sort of a general wellness effect, which is great, but maybe people want to go to the sort of the more advanced usage, if you will. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Um. So, so yeah, I, uh, so, um, yeah, I just wanted to I just want to mention that to you guys. It's um it's and and I think I think w- you all are going to experience what Dana is experiencing as this progresses, right? There's always going to be a new study coming out. People are always going to get excited and go, "Oh my gosh, can you imagine?" And we can go, "Yeah, we can imagine it." Like not only can we imagine it, we like We've been doing it, you know, as mental wellness coaches in all these different ways, you know, so let me help you go to that, go to that next step. Okay. So a lot of people got it right. That sugar is the food for the, for the bacteria um, in a, in a kombucha setting like that. Um, So let me get into some of these questions. Um, So if you had to take antibiotics and know the inflammation is in my lungs and bowels, what would be most effective? Yeah, so if you do if you do have to take antibiotics, some, sometimes you have to. Sometimes it, like that's something that you just have to do. You want to make sure that you're supporting your microbiome as much as possible. So that antibiotic is going to damage your microbiome, right? You have to you have to understand that. There's no way to prevent the damage. What you can do though is not prevent the damage, but you can make your microbiome resilient enough. So once the antibiotic is done, you're able to bounce back quickly. And so the easiest way to do that is along with the antibiotic or not along with, at, and I was just about to say at the same time, they can be taken simultaneously, but separated. So let's say you take the antibiotic every morning at 8, p- or at, at 8 a.m. You would want to take a broad spectrum um, probiotic, prebiotic, uh, two or three hours later. So if you took it at 8 a.m., you would at 11 o'clock or noon, you would take your probiotic, prebiotic. And wh- what that would do, so for example, that in the Amari product line, that would be probiotics, it would be restore, it would be mentabiotics, it could be superfood. Um, that's enough. There, there are other ones, but those are, those are so, so, some good examples. By feeding your microbiome a couple hours apart from the the antibiotic that is killing your microbiome, like I said, you're not preventing the damage, but you're keeping your micro what you're keeping the residual microbiome resilient, so that when the antibiotic goes away, now you can keep doing that regimen and eat your fibers and you know do all the wonderful things that we've talked about with the mental fitness diet, and that will have your your micro your damaged microbiome bounce back to a healthy microbiome more quickly. Okay. So yeah, that's the, that's the easiest thing to do. And the, and the, and the, the sort of moral of the story there is diversity at the same time that you're giving, you know, five or six or seven or eight different strains of bacteria. You want to be giving several different types of prebiotic fiber. You want to be eating the 30 plant challenge, right? As many different kinds of brightly colored fruits and vegetables and spices and things like that as possible to 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 keep that microbiome in that resilient state so that so that it can bounce back quickly when you're done with your regimen okay hopefully that helps um can this is is this a swear word you put in here colleen mthfr it looks like a it looks like a swear word can you talk I wanna about use i want to use the swear word when i get pushed back from it i know i know really <laughs> can you talk about mthfr and how our Mari protocol would either help or not interfere with someone who carries this gene. I get pushback sometimes when someone says their kiddo has MTHFR. Yeah, so if they're if, if they have it or their kid has it, then you know, sorry for them, right? There's nothing that you can do to 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 change it, right? That's a that's a genetic, let, let's just say genetic defect, right? It's not really a defect. We all have genetic defects, right? It's just a different type of gene than than the average person, right? Um, so people with this, so MTHFR stands for methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. 
it is the gene that makes an enzyme that is responsible for what are called methylation reactions. And methylation reactions are important because they're involved in almost every energy pathway. So people with, with, this, with this genetic defect very often are fatigued all the time. Um, it's involved in all the pathways that make neurotransmitters. So these people, these people who have the who have the genetic defect, very often have brain fog because they're not making uh, enough uh, norepinephrine, so they can't focus. They very often are um, are a little bit depressed. They might have a little bit of anxiety because they're not able to make enough serotonin and dopamine and GABA. You know, so they just they just feel kind of crummy all the time, right? Because their body is it, it's it's able to do methylation reactions. It's just not able to do them very efficiently. So you can think of somebody that doesn't have that issue. They're at 100% of their ability to methylate. And somebody who has one genetic defect might be at 80%. And somebody who has two genetic defects might be at 70%. And so you get the idea, right? You can be, you can be really good at doing methylation, so-so, not great at all. And so the, the, the idea there is that one way we can kind of bypass that problem is to give people B vitamins that are already methylated. So in order, like if, if you were to take vitamin B12 or B6 or folic acid, um, let's just say B complex vitamins in general, when we eat them, your body has to, wh whether they're in food or supplements, your body has to activate them. And that activation process is methylation. And if you're not good at methylation, then you're not going to have you're not going to have active forms of B vitamins, and therefore your energy pathways aren't going to go as efficiently. You're not going to make as many neurotransmitters. So we can say, okay, we have this problem right here with methylation. Let's try to let's go around that by giving you the methylated B vitamins. So then at least you can get some of the benefit out of these active forms of Bs. Right? That's that's one approach. Whenever we use B vitamins in any of the Amari products, we have methylated versions. Right? So people don't have to worry about that. The other piece of it is that a lot of your methylation cofactors come from your microbiome. So if you have a fully functional microbiome, you have an optimized microbiome, so to speak, you will make 100% of the methylation cofactors so that you can make your neurotransmitters and you can do your energy metabolism and you can, you can focus well and et cetera, et cetera, because your body will absorb them right from your gut. And that's one, of, that's one of the few, well, not one of the few things. It's, it's one of the really cool benefits of your microbiome that it's not just making neurotransmitters and it's not just making appetite signals, but it's making vitamins. And if we can get those in, the, in their bioactive forms, it's literally, guys, it's almost like that person doesn't even have that genetic defect, right? It's there, but it makes no difference whatsoever. Like it's, 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 uh, what what what's what's the, like I'm 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 missing the word like it they still have it but we don't even have to discuss it because the microbiome is making all the things that that genetic defect makes a problem right it's like we don't even have to discuss it anymore because because they're done right it's a, it's a it's a non-issue that's what I that's what I was thinking of and so that might take a little bit of time for them to realize that right so you get on a regimen like um the regimen that I like to recommend for those people by the way Colleen is um is the fundamentals pack even more so than happy juice at least for a month because a lot of times those people also have um they also have leaky gut um, because they have problems making mucus in their in their in their gut. So if they have problems making mucus, they have a you know they have either a low or a, a non-existent mucus lining, and they very often have inflammation and damage in their gut. So have them do fundamentals to get around that those leaky gut problems. And then if they want to, they can switch to something like a happy juice to get to have more like oomph with the motivation and the energy and things like that. Okay. Yeah. So th this, this would be for um, a kiddo. It would be the kids pack then, because it has yeah. the kids vitamin with the B, the methylated B vitamins, and then the gut brain access. Yep. Exactly. And yeah, at at least have them start off on um, the vitamins, Vita GBX, and kids fundamentals, and they might go on that for a month until they decide to switch over and say, okay, now we're going to try kids mood, or we're going to try, you know, calm or etc. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and it's a, and it's a and it's a big issue. Like people who who have this issue, uh, MTHFR, you know, SNP, um, it's it, it's it's significant, right? I mean, it's a it is a big problem for their overall quality of life. And you go out on the internet, and it's it's like 
you know, there's, there's, there's support groups and there's people recommending this and that. And I mean, it really comes down, if you understand the biochemistry of it, it really comes down to, yeah, well, here we go. Methylated B vitamins is your first step. Microbiome support is your second step. And then your third step is that it's a, it's a, it's a non-issue for you after that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah, sure. Um, now here's here's a long one. Let me see from from Lisa. Let me let me let me do this one, and then I'll go to the. I see there's a couple of hands up. So let me do this one. Um, Doctor Sean, I have a question about my son and eczema. Um, he's been on fundamentals and other kids' products since he was little, but he still struggles in winter mainly. That's very common with eczema. It's not severe, but it still bothers him. After listening to your class about the microbiome and leaky gut, I feel like some extent he must have leaky gut. He's very little dairy because he notice it worsens it which makes sense considering what you shared in that course. He also has to go on antibiotics every time he goes to the dentist. So, so I hate that this, that his good bacteria is being wiped out um, more often than it should. My question is, are there other specific strains of probiotics that would be helpful for eczema or autoimmune system issues specifically? Maybe the ones in the probiotics. That's a good thought, but no. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. I'm curious if you just have too much bad bacteria is not making enough of a difference and I'm giving them the good bacteria or maybe there's different strains that would help. Okay, so let me go back up. If he's been on fundamentals and the other kids products, that's a good approach. I wouldn't necessarily go to probiotics as the next uh, approach. I would go to, um, in the Amari product line, there's a product called Dermabiotic Spray. And so it's a it's a honey berry flavored spray that you spray in your mouth. You just go four pumps, spray, 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 and and that's it. You're done. In that formula, there it is. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a picture of it. Patty, aka Vanna White, is showing us our um, our our product of the day. So uh, it tastes really really good. Uh, kids kids love it. Um, it's got two ingredients in there. One is a flower extract called Moldovian dragon head that helps your body produce more collagen. So you spray that in, it gets to your gut. It sends a signal to whatever part of your body needs more collagen. This, this is the one problem. That's, that's marketed as a skin product. We can't really say it's going to help your skin it will definitely help your collagen production. But if you have a ligament problem and you need more collagen there, that's where it's gonna help. If you have a gut problem and you need more collagen there, that's where it's gonna help, right? So it's marketed for skin. If like if you're getting wrinkles and you have problems with your skin collagen, that's where you're gonna see the benefit. The other ingredient in there is a really specific strain of bacteria called Lactobacillus sacchi 65. 65 is a strain designation. That is uh, has what was originally isolated from Korean kimchi. And this also helps with skin tone. Um, but it the way it helps with skin tone is by, by working through the immune system. So I'm really glad that I talked about this study to begin the call. That study that was looking at lactobacilli in general, having the, its anti-depression benefits through the immune system here we have a strain, Lactobacillus sacchi 65, that's having its skin benefits also through the immune system. And so what's really, really cool about that strain is that most of the studies are in eczema, right? What we call atopic dermatitis. And it's like, it's dramatic. When we launched that product a couple of years ago, I really had to argue with our regulatory people because I had these really cool pictures that I wanted to show of here's this inflamed skin. A lot of times you'll see eczema on like elbows and like back of the knees and things like that. And so we had these amazing pictures of elbows and knees all bright red. And then six weeks later with induction of this or, or, or intake of this, um, of this, um, of this 65 strain of lactobacillus, perfectly clear skin, right? Like dramatically different pictures. And, you know, the problem was showing those pictures. And I understand why, why regulatory said this. They're like, well, you're showing that this is treating eczema. Eczema is a disease. We can't say that our products are treating diseases. But I was like, my, my pushback was, but I don't have any pictures that show here's healthy skin and here's healthier skin, right? Those studies don't exist. You have to have a problem that you're solving and then, and then you're bringing yourself back to normal state. So what we're able to say is like improve skin tone, you know, helps with skin 
uh, um, support or like all, all those nonsense things that we've talked about plenty of times in this class about there's the science and all this wonderful effect. And then there's what we can say about it when we're, when we're selling a product. So as long as we're not going out there and saying any of what I just said to sell the product, if you guys are just understanding this at a deep, deeper level and say, oh, well, this is something that I can use to solve that problem that Lisa was just asking about, that 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 I think I think makes sense to makes sense to everybody. But that's what I would recommend. I would recommend doing that four sprays a couple of times a day. There's no way you can overdose on it. I wouldn't say, you know, twist off the thing and drink it, but just take those four sprays. That's an effective amount to help with you know, your skin strengthening itself, the collagen effect, but also your skin calming itself because it's calming the immune system because it's changing what's happening in the gut. Okay. It's a really, really noticeable effect. Okay. So hope, hopefully that happens uh, or th that helps, uh, that helps you, Lisa. So let me do this. I'm going to go back to the, to the zoom meeting. And I think Patty is first in line. Can I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there you are. There we go. Okay. Um, I had a question about our Amari reboot. Um, first, how many times, like I've heard several different things. You can take it monthly or quarterly. Yeah, I don't like it monthly. I think that's too much. Okay. Um, and, the, and the reason for it is, and I think quarterly is fine. That's usually what I recommend to people. Um, the... All the ingredients in there are really, really safe. There's one ingredient though called senna, which is a it's sort of a it's sort of a light laxative. Um, it helps your you know so some of the ingredients in there help with motility, which is your gut moving food through the digestive tract. Some of them help with with urination, right? So you so you so you pee more. That's that's one method of detox. Getting your gut to move better is another method of detox. Um, there's a blend in there called sabatin that helps with this, this a patented three ingredient blend that gets your liver to detox more efficiently. So all that is really safe to take. The problem with taking too much senna for too long is that you can become dependent on it. The amount that we have in the Reboot product is a really low amount. It's not like something that you're going to get dependent on. It's not something that's going to like cause you to have... Um, you know, have to take it to in order to go to the bathroom, but I I just don't want people overusing it, right? So that that's that's why I say you know quarterly is 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 probably what you want to do for a reboot. Okay. The second part of it is like I've been sick and I'm having liver problems. Um, they're still testing. Uh, it's enlarged and I have fluid in my abdomen. Mm -hmm. That's all the info that I have. So I was doing the reboot though. Um, it's been about six weeks since I did my last one, just because I felt so crappy. And I thought maybe like the reboot would help with my immune system and my gut. Am I thinking that process through correctly? Yeah, I think I think that's OK. What you know, whenever somebody has liver strain of any sort, the only kinds of things that I will sort of recommend them away from are high dose minerals and high dose amino acids. Um, so, and, and, and we don't have any of those kinds of products in the Amari product line anyway. So there isn't anything that would be, that would be problematic for you, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go down the road too much and think like, well, you know, reboots helping my liver be a better detox organ, which is true. So therefore I would want to do that on a regular basis, which is, which is not true. Okay. So I think if you just did one, I would just, I'd see, I'd see what your doctors say about, you know, what's going on with your liver before you do another one. Yeah, I'm in the middle of it right now, but that was my thinking. And then I just got the test results back and was like, oh, good, you know, and then I was like, oh, wait. So that's why yeah. I wanted to jump on and make sure okay. that I wasn't misinterpreting it. Yep. Yep. You're thinking of it the right way. Okay. All right. And uh, Susan, you're up next. Okay. Can I go back to the collagen for a second? Yeah. Is that helpful for um, psoriasis as well? Yeah, so any um, psoriasis and eczema are the ones that um, that respond best. They're 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 different, but they're both related in that they both are characterized by inflammation and immune system dysfunction. And so, what we're doing to solve both of those is calming inflammation and calming immune system dysfunction instead of the typical um, 
the typical, you know, pharmaceutical therapy for that is, well, your immune system is overreacting and you're, and you're, and you're over inflamed. Let's squash all of that with a, with a, with an immune suppressant sort of a thing. And, you know, your symptoms go away, but then you have all these other problems of having a suppressed immune system, which are, I think is not a good trade-off. Okay. Good to know. Okay. So my question, I have a client that has uh, serotonin syndrome. Okay. Um, she's had some high blood pressure problems, history of anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's, so they're playing with her meds right now, but she's nauseous, diarrhea, diarrhea, major anxiety, headaches, no appetite. Um, she's currently using mentabiotic protein, uh, like the MRA protein and seed fiber. Mm-hmm. Um, any suggestions for her there? I know I would, I would just, I would just tell her to stick with that. So the mentabiotics is going to help her own body regulate her neurotransmitters better. Um, serotonin syndrome is tough because it it's like, it's not going to come from supporting your gut. It's not going to even come from using herbals, right? They're just not powerful enough. When the reason people get serotonin syndrome is because they're overdosed on their antidepressant, anti-anxiety drugs. And so the doctors are going to have to work to find out like, all right, she's getting too much how do we make that enough, but not too much, right? So they're going to play around with her medications, play around with the different combinations. And that can be a process sometimes until she gets to a place where she feels good, but doesn't have the symptoms of being over-medicated. Um, and I think I think something like mentabiotics is going to help her stay more regulated than not, if that makes sense. Okay. okay. And once she's more regulated, she would like to try to wean off off of she's on Zoloft. She would like to try to wean off of that with her doctor, obviously. Yeah, but and then and then her doctor will be able to work with her to do to do step down therapy to say, okay, you're on this amount of drug. Um, now you're on this amount of whatever the natural regimen is, whether it's going to be happy juice or fundamentals or mentabiotics plus mood plus, which is like for people who are really struggling with with depression and anxiety, those are the two products that I really want them on. Um like that would be the core of whatever else they try mentabiotics to help the gut and, and mood plus to help the brain. Like you're helping the gut brain axis from, from two sides simultaneously. Um, and with that, it's easier for the, for the prescriber to help them with their, with their step down trajectory. Like it might be one step every week. It might be one step every two weeks, depend, depending on what their, what their drug regimen looks like. Okay. okay. She was currently taking like one mood plus, um, with the mentabiotic. Um, so she's okay to still stay on that mood plus. Yeah, I think cool. so. And just let her, let her prescribers know what, what, you know, what, what she's doing so that they know, okay. you know, to, like what, what they don't want is for her to be saying like, oh, this week I'm taking mentabiotics and mood plus and next week I'm not right? Because then that, that upsets her baseline and that makes it more difficult for the prescribers to figure out what's going on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I could keep you here all day asking you questions, but I like (laughs) That's all right. What does, that's why we do these, right? Um, So we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, Let me, let me jump back into the chat real quick and then I'll, I'll I'll jump back over to to you, Katie Todd. Um, Let me see. Okay. Here's where we are. Um, We've talked about uh, how there are many doors for weight loss. I've found one of mine is blood sugar. What is the best product for that and times to take them? I also want to know about mental wellness diet and what are the best tips, especially for a healthy blood sugar diet. I feel like it could be the answer for a way to eat and live. Yeah. So, so Michelle, um, yeah, blood sugar is one of the most important things to control for overall weight loss benefits, right? For, 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 for a couple of really important benefits. If your blood sugar is fluctuating like crazy, anytime it's really high, your body is not burning fat. High blood sugar signals stop burning. And so that's not not a place you want to be. Low blood sugar signals eat. So low blood sugar will send a very potent signal to the brain that you're hungry. And it's a different kind of hungry than stress eating. It's a different kind of hunger than like than, than actual like true hunger. So if your blood sugar is fluctuating a lot, when it's high, you're not burning fat. And when it's when it's low, you're you're adding fat because because you're you're eating, right? You're gonna you're gonna listen to that signal and you're gonna eat something. The other reason is well, well th- that's it. Those are the those are the two big reasons. Um so how do you control blood sugar? Um, eating a balanced macro diet is, is one of the best ways to do it. So anytime you eat, 
it's going to be a combination of proteins, fats, fibers, um, carbohydrates. Um, you're never going to eat a carbohydrate on its, on its own. You probably will never eat any of the macronutrients on its own. I do this thing all the time. And I, I think I talk about this in the weight loss module, um, the, what I call the helping hand, where you say this is every time you eat like a meal, this is your fruits and vegetables it takes up this much, basically half of your plate. This is your concentrated carbohydrates about the size of a tightly closed fist. This is your protein about the size of the palm of your hand. doesn't really matter how thick it is, but just, just to give you a sort of a facing. And this is your added fat, the, the, the circle that, that your finger and your, your index finger and your thumb make when you make, a, when you make an okay sign, right? All of that for most people is gonna be about 500 calories. So you don't have to count your carb grams. You don't have to count your calories. You don't have to count anything. You just do that at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you've got... 1500 calories approximately right there, right? And it's going to be metabolically appropriate, right? Combination of all those macros. So it controls your blood sugar really nicely. The other thing that probably the product that controls blood sugar the best in, in the Amari product line um, is the edge product. And that's because it has an ingredient in there. Um, the, the lychee extract is such a good blood sugar controller that sometimes it can take people who are prone to hypoglycemia, prone to low blood sugar, it can push them into hypoglycemia if they take it on an empty stomach. So be cautious there. Most people, like I took my edge this morning on an empty stomach, and usually that's really good, that, that's really fine for me. I was just traveling. Um, I was in Turkey for five days. I was in London for two days. I was very sleep deprived. When I was coming back, I took my my um, my mentobiotics and my edge in the morning like I normally do, but I had only gotten like maybe three hours of sleep that night before I went to the airport to get a, to get an early flight, and I got shaky. It 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 crashed my blood sugar. Uh, that can happen sometimes, right? That's not a normal situation for me, obviously, right? Having traveled for a bunch of days, you know, been up late, time zones, all that kind of stuff. Um, so th that that was unusual for that to happen to me. And I'm not usually that prone to hypoglycemia, just a, just a little bit if I don't eat on a on a on a regular basis. Uh, but if you are prone to that, the that lychee extract can be potent enough. To, to, to push you that way. In the trials that we've done, we've been able to show that blood sugar levels get very, very well regulated. And because of that, fat burning is better. And because of that, appetite levels are better. So it almost makes the, it easier for someone to lose weight if they're already on a good regimen. Okay. So that's, that's what I would recommend to you. The, the weight loss products, you know, and I, you notice I did that in quotes in the Amari product line, GBX Fit and GBX Burn also have ingredients that help with blood sugar modulation, but they're actually doing other things that are important for weight loss, right? So one of the ingredients helps increase appetite hormones like, like GLP-1. That's the same thing that is this like Ozempic is the synthetic version of doing that. I'll talk more about that maybe next week as we get closer to the kind of weight loss season. Um, one of the ingredients in there helps with, um, with, uh, with leaky gut. One of the ingredients in, in there helps with inflammation. One of the ingredients helps with, um, with browning fat. So you burn more calories, you know, so those are all other, like in, in your question, you said doorways to help with weight loss, but if blood sugar, if you have determined blood sugar is the one that you really need to focus on edge is what's going to do it for you. Okay. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that helps, uh, answer that question. And let me do one more in here and then I'll, and then I'll come back, Katie. Um, let me see. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Um, um, okay. Here's a question. My question is on the effects of, excuse me, taking sleep plus and kids come together. I know someone, a male, 190 pounds, took one of each together and he slept about seven or eight hours, woke up disoriented, which lasted for several hours. Um, also to note that he has really bad sleep habits. And he also has and he also had two whiskeys that same night before going to bed. So I'm just going to go out on a limb and say it might have been the two whiskeys um, that in combination with deeper sleep made him disoriented when he woke up. Um, there's There's no real reason that you need to do doubling on products like that. So the sleep plus and kids calm 
are basically the same formulas. Um, they're different delivery formats. Um, you know, kids, kids calm is a gummy sleep plus is a capsule. Um, at the last Amari convention, we taste tested a, yet another version that was a chocolate, um, like a dark chocolate, sugar-free dark chocolate. And people seem to like that one too. So these are just different delivery methods of the same formula, which is really based on that corn grass. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it was probably, you know, so due to, due to the product or due to the fact that he had better sleep, it might've, it might've been due to the other, the other natural products that he was using at the, at the same time. Okay. So let me, let me go to the, let me go to the, back to the video and try to get these questions before we have to stop. So, um, Katie, go ahead. I had a question from last week, a couple, you had talked about Lyme disease. Yeah. And, um, I know I have someone that they were trying to figure out what was going on with her body and they think she has Lyme disease and you had mentioned Mentasync. Yeah. So, so um, a lot of times I'll recommend Mentasync because it's so good at closing those, um, those tight junctions, right. Closing, helping, helping you solve leaky gut, right. Improving gut integrity. Um, that can be a big, big problem with people who have Lyme disease. The other piece of it is that the, like the Wellmune, the, the glucan we just talked about, like at, at the top of this call, that helps to directly prime your immune system. And a lot of times people who have Lyme, their immune system is suppressed to a level where it's not able to sort of find and fight that residual infection. So you're doing two things there, right? You're solving something at the level of the gut that's gonna help the immune system. And you're directly priming the immune system from low back up to normal through 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 different mechanisms, right? Different ingredients are doing the gut piece and doing the immune system piece, um, and so that's going to help that that person's overall immune system. So it could be that they take just meant to sink, but what I like them to do is take something like fundamentals, so they have a more comprehensive approach to support their entire gut brain axis. Because someone with Lyme is also going to have problems with brain fog and energy levels and mood. And, you know, it's not just an immune system thing, right? Just like we say all the time, your mood isn't just a brain thing. It's a gut brain thing, right? The same thing goes for one of those sort of syndromey problems like Lyme or post COVID or fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue or any of those, there's a lot going on and you need a regimen that, that, that addresses a lot of those different touch points. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I had another question, and I know I asked this in the discussion board about erythro erythromyalgia. Is that how you say it? The, um, so yeah, so that's like a that's like a um, if I'm if I'm if I'm thinking about it the right way, it's uh, it's it's like diffuse muscle pain, right? It's someone who's achy all the time. Is that is that what you're talking about? She has burning. Um, basically, her her feet are on fire, and now it's moving up into her hands and her face. And so she ha keeps her home temperature at like fifty four degrees, and she walks around barefoot, and she gets feet sores. And yeah, yeah. So that that could be related to nerves. It could be related to muscles. It could be related to her, to the thing that holds muscles together. Something called fascia. Um, it could be related to just circulation in general. And so, you know, again, it's like that's one of those syndromes where you don't necessarily can you can't really pinpoint like the one thing that's the problem, like the MTHFR that we talked about earlier. Right. That's one thing. And we can very easily solve that by, by sort of going around the problem here. It could be, could be, could be, could be. And so you need to come at that with a bunch of things simultaneously. And so I would go back to something like start with the fundamentals. See if you can sort of regulate that entire signaling system that we call the gut brain axis. And, you know, worst case scenario, she's just going to feel better from a mental wellness perspective. And then you can see like, all right, how, how's she doing after a month? Is there something else we want to add? Do we want to say, let's think about, you know, a blood flow enhancer like a nitro or or an anti-inflammatory like a relief or an omega or a sunset or something like that. But I would say start with something easy like a fundamentals to try to reset that whole system. Okay, thank you. Okay, sure thing. And let's jump over to Sedalia. Hi, so I had this sleep question. My, my The point of my question was more, so you just said that um, 
it's basically the same product, different delivery systems, right? Yeah. So this was a mistake. He didn't pay attention to the instructions. That's basically what happened. He took the two together. But taking, if that happens again to someone, taking one of each, I mean, what could possibly happen? What does your body do with it, I guess? Yeah, so so taking more isn't going to necessarily make it more effective, right? So most most natural products are are what we call flexible usage sorts of products, right? Whenever we formulate something like that, we'll say, here's the dosage recommendation. It's two capsules, for example. That's based on the science to deliver an effect on average. You know, so when you do a clinical trial, you say, yeah, this regimen worked, you know, and the supplement group did this and the placebo group did that. So it worked. But if you dig into those data, you'll get some people who had a big effect. You'll get some people who had a little effect. You'll have some people who had no effect whatsoever. And But on average, it worked for, you know, the 30 people that were in the supplement group, for example. And so the flexible usage is that two capsule dosage might be too little or too much or just right for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so that's why I, I really recommend that people say, all right, start with the recommended dosage and then judge for yourself. Like, did that make me groggy when I woke up the next morning? Maybe I overproduced melatonin and I didn't need that much. Maybe I wasn't producing enough and I need more. So you'll see, you'll see people like you go out on, on like some of the Facebook groups and you'll see people saying, yeah, two did it for me. I sleep like a baby now. And other people saying, nope, I need to take three. And other people saying, nope, that's too much for me. I only take one. And other people saying, I only take it every other night. And other people saying, I only take it on the nights that I really need to sleep. You know, so like that is perfectly appropriate for people to do. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And if you, and if you were to do like, all right, I really need to sleep tonight. I'm going to take six. None of the products are going to re represent a problem, so to speak, right? The only problem with taking six would be, wait a minute, you just took a triple dose, which is really expensive. And maybe you only needed a regular dose, right? So the biggest thing was the problem was you wasted your money. Right. And your body's just going to take what it needs. It's going right. to Okay. Right, exactly. And that's different. The way natural products work is different than if you said, oh, here's an Ambien. My doctor told me to take one, but I really need to sleep. So I'm going to take three. That's a completely different biological effect in the body. That could be problematic. Like that person might not wake up, you know, which is a problem. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And let's do, let's, let's do the last one, Patty, and then we'll, and, and then we'll wrap it up for today. Mine actually is a question that Nori asked, but it really made me start thinking about it over there. She was asking about the superfoods having more fiber in it than the GBX seed fiber. Okay, say that again. I'm also reading Nori's question here about I have a customer who has take, been taking Sunrise that's been helping her. No, it's down a little bit further. For her eczema too. And that, that makes perfect sense because eczema has a, a, an inflammatory compound uh, aspect to it and an oxidative aspect to it. So you, you're sort of like with some, something like sunrise, you're, you're solving the problem here, right? So, so let me, let me, let me try to, if you guys can watch me, I wish I had a whiteboard to, to, to do this, but here's the problem, right? Your skin is inflamed. Um, you can come one level down and say, what's causing that skin to be inflamed? It's probably because your cells are oxidized and inflamed. So let's calm that oxidation inflammation. If we do that with something like sunrise or even sunset, that would that would solve the problem. Your skin would be less inflamed. You'd have less redness. But if that inflammation and oxidation is coming from someplace else, if it's coming from just the cells, Hallelujah, you solve the problem at the root. But if that inflammation oxidation is coming from below that, if it's coming from the microbiome, if it's coming from the immune system, you need to solve it down here with a microbiome intervention. And so like, you know, the solution of course is if you don't know where you're solving it from, solve it from both places simultaneously. Take them both and you get a benefit here at this level and you get a benefit here at this level. Um, and unfortunately we don't always know. That's why when we, we developed fundamentals years ago, we said, wait a minute, it, you know, it's not just a brain problem, it's a gut brain problem, but let's do something in the brain, neurotransmitter balance, neuron signaling, that kind of stuff, blood flow, and let's do something at the source of that inflammation, your immune system, and let's do something that controls the immune system, gut integrity, and let's do something for the microbiome. You guys get the idea. The more of those levels you can address simultaneously, the better overall effect you're going to get, okay? 
So go go ahead. Sorry, sorry, I interrupted you. No, that's fine. Um, it was about the GBX superfood fiber content compared to the GBX seed fiber content. Okay, yeah, I see it. I see it now. Yeah. Okay. So this is when we list fiber on a label, you can only list total fiber. So let's say it says, let's say it says five grams of fiber. You don't necessarily know if that fiber is going to be prebiotic fiber or not. And it's really the prebiotic fiber that we're talking about. You could have five grams of fiber that's coming from like wheat fiber. And that's going to, that's fine for, for like regularity in your gut, but it's not really going to d- deliver a lot of um, prebiotic fiber to nourish your microbiome. So in those products, it's, it's it's almost 100% of the fiber that you see on the label is prebiotic fiber. So, you know, they're not they're not as high fiber in terms of grams as a lot of fiber products that are on the market, but those high fiber products are very often low in prebiotic fiber. Does that make sense? Like what we're really trying to focus on is prebiotic fiber. And in superfood versus seed fiber, I should look at them and say like one of them I think is 4 and one of them is 3. Maybe right. Which in in the world of do you have them handy right there? I how many how many grams does it say on each one of those? Uh, Maury, if you can read those off to the me. The seed fiber says the three, three, and what's and super, food? super super food is five. Okay, so right there you're gonna get you're probably going to get, I'd have to go back and look at the exact formulation and do the calculation, but of eight grams of total fiber that you're getting there, you're probably going to get seven of that as prebiotic fiber. Um, It can, it can, it's very rare that it's going to be a hundred percent, but the fiber um, sources that we chose in those are, are basically prebiotic sources that really nourish the gut there. They also help with regularity, but, but that isn't, that isn't the benefit that we're trying to deliver there. Okay. Logical. Okay. I take both of those every single morning um, as my happy juice. So my happy juice every single morning is those two products, seed fiber and superfood, along with mentabiotics and edge. That's what I start every single morning with. And it like it's helps me close that fruit and vegetable gap. It helps me close the fiber gap. It helps nourish the microbiome, you know, all the all the things, all the things that we talk about here. Okay. Can I also just make one other comment to Katie, what she was talking about? Because I have fibromyalgia and um, when I started with the company, I've been on it six months and I started with the fundamentals. I've stayed with the fundamentals and my neuropathy and my feet has changed immensely. It's not gone, but I have to do like walking used to irritate it constantly. Um, I actually got up to 10,000 steps this summer, walking outside, um, taking them into sync three times a day at, with the fundamentals, like doing the whole thing in the morning yeah. and then taking another two doses of the meant to sync. And that has done amazing things. So I just wanted to just put that out there for her client that is having neuropathy because that is excruciating Yeah, and my feet where I couldn't walk, like I couldn't walk on carpet even, and I can walk much better now. And like I said, I actually got up to taking actually active steps to exercise without extreme pain this That's summer. Awesome. Say that, so, say that regimen again, just so everybody can hear it. If they, if they miss it the first time you said it. Um, I take fundamentals, all of them in the morning, including heart. So the, the focus, think, and heart with the mentabiotics. I do that in the morning and then in the afternoon and evening, I take another dose of meant to seek two capsules each in the afternoon and in the evening. And I have diagnosed fibromyalgia and was having severe neuropathy. Like I couldn't walk on. And um, that has allowed me to get up to walking this past summer, 10,000 steps with still pain, but pain that I could tolerate, not excruciating. So I just wanted to put that out there when I was listening to Katie, because neuropathy is horrible, especially when it's on your feet. Yep. hundred percent. And let let me answer this last one that's in the, in the chat about weaning off of melatonin uh, with, with calm. So when weaning a six-year-old off melatonin and swapping for calm, 
would you say it should be tiered and maybe transition over a period of about two weeks to a month? I've tried to advise to have patience and not give up right away. Customer tried cold turkey and it didn't work. Yeah, that's the, that's the worst thing to do. So typical step down, right? And so th 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 this is something that is like the same formula is used to get adults off of antidepressants, anti-anxieties, sleep drugs, et cetera. We would do the exact same thing for melatonin, whether it's an adult or a child, where you would say, Here's them at 100% of their dose of the of the medicine of the drug, and they would take they would start taking 100% of whatever natural regimen they're going to do, whether that's a fundamentals or a happy juice or a mood plus or in this case a kids calm or a sleep plus. They would take that 100% level of the new natural supplement along with 100% of whatever they're taking, sort of synthetically, and they would do that for about a week. Um, with melatonin, that's about as long as you need to retrain the body to start making its own melatonin. So you're adding in Kids Calm and melatonin at the same time. You're doing that for one week. Then on the second week, you take away the melatonin at at at, at ideally at 25%. Sometimes you can't do that, right? It might just be a three mil three milligram tablet or capsule. So maybe you can break it in half. Maybe you could open it up and only take half of the powder in a, you know, in a juice or a drink or something like that. So, you know, you're taking a little bit less for the next week. So a hundred percent of the kids come and a little bit less of that melatonin, 25% less or 50% less for another week. Okay. Then on week now, now that's two weeks. Now week three, you take the melatonin down just a little bit. So not down to zero yet, probably maybe down to 25% of the original dose. And you do that for a week. Then by the fourth week, sometimes the fifth week, you're able to go down to zero of the melatonin. And by then the body is fully trained to use the building blocks in calm to make its own melatonin at whatever level that you need. And so that's the, like that's just a standard framework scenario for what we call step down therapy. Um, and it'll, you know, some people can go faster. Some people can go slower. You might have a period where you, where you take a step down and it it's, it's not good, right? You don't feel good. You don't sleep well. Well, if that's the case, then go back up and go for another week at that level and then try to step down more the next week. Right. And that's, that's all very individualized situation. Okay. So hopefully that helps. Um, I'll throw it out back out to the, to the video group one last time. If there's any really important stuff that we didn't get to, if you guys want to want to unmute and ask or raise your hands or anything. And if not, all right, I'll post up in the discussion area when we'll have this webinar uh, next week. Um, I think we'll probably not do like a lunchtime. We did lunchtime last week and we did lunchtime this week. So next week we'll probably go back to like a, you know, one of the, one of the evening, evening time blocks or something like that. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining me this week, you guys. And I'll, I'll see you next time. Okay.